folks, Joseph A. Sabori here, and we're back with the Back to the Future trilogy, starting with Back to the Future Part 2. Yep, it's a sequel to the original Back to the Future, where we all left off uh, at the last scene of the original Back to the Future, where suddenly uh, Marty gets taken for another ride with, with Doc Brown. On a modified uh, DeLorean, only this time, instead of going back from 1985 to 1955, he goes back into the future from 1985 to 2015, which is today, actually. <laughs> of course, we're actually living in 2015 that's in an alternate way, because compared to what you saw in Part 2, Part 2 is more futuristic compared to what we are now. Ours is just far different. Although we are getting some of the technology that we're already predicting already as it is. Yes, we are actually getting hoverboards, but they're still working on that. So they are real, as even though they weren't exactly real when, when the movie was made. Um, but now it's coming true. And not, not to mention, we're getting Nike Air Mags uh, self lacing shoes because they already started making them back in the early 2010s as part of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. So they started making the shoes that looks exactly like the ones you saw in the movie. So it's like a replica of it with lights. Unfortunately, this version probably has um, some laces as it is. So. But who knows? We'll probably will get some of the self lacing ones that that does it automatically once it's built and it is going to be ready to be available sometime later this year hopefully so that way I can actually get one of those shoes you know later in the future because I already have all these other Nike shoes that I'm wearing especially that new one that I got for my birthday there are some like 50-50 you know, of some of them being right and others being wrong too but when it comes to those predictions, who knows how they're going to turn out. But I know half of those predictions that they mentioned is, isn't really true. I can even tell from the looks of it. I mean, coming from the newspaper that they show from USA Today and, and all this other stuff. And all the buildings that you saw in Hill Valley and all the rest. I mean, we don't see any flying cars anywhere in our 2015 uh, alternate time because... Well, they may exist, which they do. Unfortunately, they they're not available to the public because of, you know, because of budget constraint, and but it's also because of traffic problems. Yeah, I mean, think of it this way: imagine if if you're actually on your apartment and you, and you see a lot of flying cars flying around, it's going to be really hard too, especially if if none of them work anymore. And you'll probably wind up crashing if it runs out of gas easily. So, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. I don't know. But we haven't seen any of that, so... We're already getting just regular cars as usual. And I know gas prices are getting higher these days, and that's another problem, too. <laughs> it even predicted it, too, because when, when I saw the movie with the gas prices that I saw on, on, on that Texaco gas station, you want to believe how higher the prices were compared to what we are getting today. This one was like going up to $6 and $7 even more. God, that would be even more higher than ever before to get gas. Yeah, so... <laughs> but I guess it had to be. Who knows how everything's going to turn out um, this year. I know they had a predicament on, on having the Chicago Cubs uh, winning the World Series. and That's in the movie. But who knows how that's going to turn out this year. If, if this prediction may be true or not. Otherwise, that's just part of the whole idea. You know, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale didn't really want to come up with a sequel to the Back to the Future movies. Especially when the fact that both Part 2 and 3 are shot back to back from 1989 to 1990. Yeah. 
And the fact is, he didn't originally want to do it at first because the pr problem with sequels, though, is that you know people need to have an opinion on it. So it that's the idea. Yeah, like people are going to have an opinion on whenever they're going to like the sequels that they just actually done. Yeah, compared to the first movie that they just did. Yeah, which apparently Pact of the Future was supposed to be a standalone film, as it is, and they thought the ending scene to the movie was going to be as a joke until so they added the, the to be continue sign at the end of the movie that's on home video releases except for the DVD and Blu-ray but that's what I like about the sequels though because at least they were trying to become a continuation of the story to where they all left off so like we want to see more of it how the story is going to take place after the first movie so yeah that's the whole purpose of it because now it's becoming a franchise and it became so popular that we started getting a lot of merchandising and everything that we had for the film so that's just what we we're going to go for and that's what i love about back to the future it's actually fun it's exciting it's hilarious it's the idea about what was it like if you want to have a time machine of your own and try to fix history the way you wanted it you know, like if history wasn't written at this point, you want to change everything that happened in the past so that way it sets to a whole new journey in life so that way things will go out for the better if not for the worse. Yeah, it becomes a whole new alternate universe. That's the whole point of these movies is that we want to change things for the better. So... <laughs> That's for sure. So anyway, let's get back to my review of Back to the Future Part 2, which stars Michael J. Fox, once again, as Marty McFly, which he also plays different roles this time around, with Marty's future son, Marty Jr., along with his future daughter, Marlene McFly. So, and yes, he also plays his older self as well. Christopher Lloyd as Dr. Emmett Brown, also known as Doc Brown, simply. Thomas F. Wilson as Biff Tannen, also plays his older self as well, along with his uh, grandson, his future grandson, Griff Tannen. Yeah, plays exactly like, <laughs> like Biff. Leah Thompson. Reprising this role as Lorraine Baines McFly, who's also um, now older. Yeah. Elizabeth Shue, who's replacing Claudia Wells as Jennifer Parker, Marty McFly's girlfriend. James Tolkien as Principal Mr. Strickland. Jeffrey Wiseman replacing Crispin Glover as George McFly. Yeah. Basically just wearing the makeup and all that to resemble uh, Crispin Glover. Even though they did show uh, some of his archive footage of him f from the first movie. Along with Elijah Wood in a very small role as the video game boy. Um, uh, Casey Samesco, Billy Zane, both of them as Biff's friends. Yeah, they replied once again. And Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers as Douglas J. Needles, yeah. who happens to be um, Marty's uh, next nemesis. It's written once again by Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis, and directed by Robert Zemeckis. The movie begins set on Saturday, October 26, 1985. Marty McFly, who's played by Michael J. Fox, had opened the garage to finally spot his lifelong dream as to owning a black Toyota 4x4 pickup truck, which I know that's what we saw in the closing climax of the original Back to the Future, where he was about to take it on a ride with his girlfriend Jennifer, who's now being played by Elizabeth Shue, replacing Claudia Wells due to the fact that Wells' mother was suffering from an illness and passed away afterwards and you know she stopped working and 
and tried to move on with her life until years later, so she couldn't reprise her role. Doc Emmer Brown, who's played by Christopher Lloyd, had arrived in his monitorized DeLorean time machine. Yeah, he's all dressed up uh, in a futuristic fashion, only to find out that, that he was going to offer Marty, along with Jennifer, to, to come for the ride on their quest to go back to the future, which turns out to be, as we speak, 2015. We actually get to the scene where where Marty asked um, Doc about what happens to us in the future? Are we going to become assholes or something? And Doc says, oh no, you turn out fine. It's your kids, Marty. Something's going to happen to your kids. So they decided to go on the ride along with Einstein the dog. And then Marty says, um, we need to back up. We won't be able to make it to 88 miles per hour. And then <laughs> that famous line, as we heard, was when uh, Doc says, Roads? Well, where are we going? We don't need roads. And they started to fly all the way up into the sky as it disappears, and, and they wound up in, as we speak, October 21st, 2015, in Hill Valley, where everything seems to change that's more in a futuristic world. Yeah, sort of in the in the Blade Runner or Metropolis type of world that they had. Where suddenly they wound up up in the sky with a huge traffic filled with uh, flying cars everywhere. You know, and, it, and already uh, Doc had just electronically knocked out Jennifer, which later they went into the alley and they left her there asleep because that way she won't be woken up to find out all the information that's that's going to happen on future events. <laughs> so anyway, their mission was that Marty has to pose his own son, you know, Marty Jr., in order to actually refuse him to offer to participate in a robbery with Biff's grandson, Griff, you know, who was played by Thomas F. Wilson, of course. Yeah, always the bully. Wait, he switched places and refused, uh, Griff's offer once uh, he went inside Hill Valley 2015 the way it was modernized similar to what he saw in 1955 and, and 85 of course only it's it's done very differently now you know already the courthouse has all been modernized you know, with glass windows you know, with the clock tower being still there you know, we see a lot of flying cars and, and the other cars already on the ground Everybody is wearing all these futuristic fashions. And you can see all these places that we got, including Texaco, already being monitorized. But all the flying cars is on top, while the bottom is 7-Eleven. And all the movie feeders, including that one feeder that plays Jaws 19. <laughs> that was directed by Steven Spielberg's son, Max Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, because that was that scene where suddenly a holographic... CGI look of the shark about ready to actually attack uh, Marty only to realize that <laughs> this was a fake shark and then he... yeah because it disappears after that yeah. it does look pretty cheesy the way they shot that but it was it was really fun because that much famous line right there was when Marty says shark still looks fake <laughs> yeah he finally went to uh, Cafe 80s, which, yep, it was modernized after that cafe that you saw in, in the original Back to the Future, which was the 50s cafe. Yeah, if you think about it. <laughs> it's, well, it's a cafe that was built at the time. Yeah, this time the Cafe 80s is where you see a lot of 80s nostalgia that's built in. You can see Michael Jackson, Ronald Reagan, and Dalai Lama all in... Max Headroom form you know, on the screens, and then then you can see a multi TV screen that has all these 80 shows, including Taxi and Family Ties. You have both shows with Christopher Lloyd and and Michael J. Fox in them, along with Wheel of Fortune and the Smurfs and Miami Vice included. And they got all the stuff that they had too. They even had an arcade game where we get to see Elijah Wood as Video Game Boy in that scene. <laughs> Yeah, because I know Marty started to, to test out the, the shooting game, that is. And then, of course, he orders a, a Pepsi Perfect that's all in in a monorized um, 
glass bottle that they had and then suddenly he spotted uh, Biff and an older self you know because he's now an old man and you know and he has a grandson of course named Griff so I figured yeah they're I guess they're sort of related at this point yeah because he now has a cane and that has a a fist on it and he just knocks it on his head saying hello hello is everybody in there Anyway, Griff and his friends had arrived. Yeah, even has and one of the friends, of course, which was a Japanese guy played by Jason Scott Lee. This one of the friends almost looked exactly like a replica of of the guys in in the class of 1984, which was a film that Michael J. Fox was in. They actually started chasing Marty around, yeah, Marty Jr. Yeah, <laughs> and then by actually uh, only to find out that. It had that same scene that's similar to the one that you saw in the original Back to the Future. It was in there? They're about to chase him around. Instead of a skateboard, it's a hoverboard. Yeah, yeah. Marty spotted a metal hoverboard that the two little girls had actually had gotten, and he took the handles that has those metal logos on them, and and he's about to race for his life by being chased after Biff and his friends. Because they, they started to bring in their own hoverboards. Well, Griff actually has the huge one that's uh, <laughs> the Mad Dog hoverboard. And yeah, he even brought in his bat just so he can swing him around. So they flew all the way around the entire town of Hill Valley until suddenly uh, Marty went straight into the pond where he was already getting stuck and was ready to fall until Marty actually swings back and he fell on, onto the pond. And then Griff and his friends actually went straight into the courthouse yeah, in, on the glass window. <laughs> and they all got arrested after that. Yeah, the one that has the clock tower. So now, uh, after they saw uh, USA Today's uh, newspaper, which was tomorrow's newspaper, it's, it finally had changed. So now Griff and his friends had finally went back to jail for all the damage that they caused. So now, <laughs> Marty Jr. has won free. After that mission has complete, Marty actually went to uh, to Blast from the Past store, where after he found out that the Chicago Cubs had won the World Series against Miami, he ends up buying a gray sports almanac, which ranged from 1950 to 2000. Yeah, mostly because Marty wants to bet on winnings, no matter what happens uh, when he goes back in time and in the past and the, or the future for that matter so maybe you'll be able to win enough to become more wealthier and rich <laughs> Doc thought that this was a bad idea because it'll probably affect everybody's lives and yeah it'll probably be even worse as it seems so then Doc suddenly froze it in the trash until Biff and stole the almanac and not only that but Jennifer was being taken away by two female cops from Hill Valley and was been taken away into Hilldale where suddenly they went inside uh, Marty's new home along with his family including you know Marlene which is Marty's uh, daughter Michael J. Fox in drag <laughs> as it seems yeah he plays uh, different characters in the film you have Marty Jr. and his daughter not to mention his older self of <laughs> Marty McFly so that's really cool yeah, of course, he even spotted uh, Lorraine, already older, along with uh, his father, George, who was riding on an or ortho, um, sort of an orthopedic uh, machine that, that lets you uh, fly around. You get to move you know, upside up and upside down and flying around, you know, feeling good for yourself and everything. And then they had all this technology that they had, even including that oven, which you can actually... Uh, be able to put in all your foods like the like the pan pizza from Pizza Hut and within three seconds it becomes uh, huge yeah from Black and Decker and then it also has uh, you yeah, know Mr. Chef and all these other uh, stuff that they they use for the kitchen and of course they're just drinking you know Diet Pepsi, Pepsi, Perfect and <laughs> You know, and tea and all that while eating pizza with the family so it was cool 
So yeah, Jennifer's already awakened and spotted all this, and then he even spotted uh, Marty Jr. watching um, an HD TV filled with multi channels. <laughs> kind of like where we're getting today now, because we have HD TVs, and but I think we do have some TVs that have multi channels. I mean, it was a common thing because it's they've been using it for years. But then you know he was already making a call from his uh, nemesis named Douglas. Jay Needles, who's played by Flea, he did something completely wrong and causes uh, Marty to get fired from his job. That's where we see all these facts that says, you're fired, on <laughs> all these papers. And then he says the line, oh, this is heavy. So, yeah, so things didn't seem as everything was going to go, and then, then suddenly Jennifer spotted uh, his older self, <laughs> and this is, this is when she says, I'm old! And she says, I'm young. Both in unison and, and they all faint. <laughs> so then Doc and Marty had to carry her out of out of there. And then where all of a sudden the, the DeLorean finally appeared back after Biff once up in there for the first time. Yeah, while wow, the cane was stuck in there. And the, yeah, half of his cane that's, that's uh, stuck. And then suddenly he disappears. I know they didn't show that he was disappearing from like he was going to be erased from existence in, in the deleted scene because they thought this was just going to be another problem but I knew he, he was going to disappear because of what he did so then when uh, Marty and and Doc along with Jennifer and Einstein had came back to 1985 it turns out that 1985 isn't what it seems so it actually changed dramatically in, in a very worse way. So once they left uh, Jennifer and Einstein on the porch at her house, uh, Marty went back to his house only to find out that it's being run by an African American family. Yeah, where the father started to try to beat him up with a bat. He's, he keeps smashing things by accident. And then he left. <laughs> and then he was about to escape until he spotted a newspaper that that reveals uh, the year which turns out that that same porch in the house was actually Mr. Strickland who was played by James Tolkien yeah and he was already dressed up uh, wearing a bulletproof dress and and all these <laughs> all these bullets that he that he's wearing around and, and he has a shotgun too yeah he, he was almost threatening to shoot uh, Marty McFly until suddenly <laughs> Again, a shooter started shooting him around the house, you know, and then he, then he has a shotgun and he says, Eat lead, slackers! That, that, that was a fun scene I liked. I mean, I thought that was one of the funniest scenes and one of the coolest scenes I ever saw from Mr. Strickland because this is like a cool self of him, like he's sort of becoming a commando compared to what he looked like when he was just a principal in high school. <laughs> so, the whole world became into a, an ultimate nightmare. It's all chaotic and I almost feel like it's sort of a, a representation of the scene in uh, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, when George uh, reveals that he didn't want to be born at all, that he suddenly spotted uh, Bedford Falls already being changed into an alternate universe where it now becomes Pottersville that's owned by uh, the miser himself um, Mr. Potter it has sort of in that same situation only it's different because this time it's Marty who's who's around and he spotted everything that's from bad to worse but that's when he went inside Hill Valley where, where we spotted all these bikers around all these uh, places that's turned into like porno feeders and all this other crap that they had. And it even has the courtroom that turns into a hotel and casino as well as a museum that's owned by Biff Tannen since he became so rich and wealthy after he spotted the, the Gray Sports Almanac that he got. And then not to mention uh, he actually married uh, Lorraine and George McFly was murdered. Which I know, that's sad, as we found out. Yeah, because he was murdered in 1973. And then all of a sudden, 
we spotted that Doc actually has been committed to an insane asylum. So then, Doc and Marty have found evidence that Biff had used the time machine to deduce that, that he changed everything from the past into the future 1985. So that means the 1985 that they were in now was an alternate 1985 which is part of the time condemnum so that means what they saw in 1955 and 2015 all the way to the present which was 1985 creates itself to 1985 in a sort of weird way so yes Biff changed everything they begin to find out that the sports almanac was taken from Biff and then already he had to ask Biff to see where he got the almanac and it turned out he saw his older self uh, giving it to him so he can bet on winnings and yeah he did he was already being chased by him only to find out that he actually did murder George McFly with that gun that he was ready to shoot with Marty so then yeah he finally uh, jumped out of the building and landed into the DeLorean where Doc actually knocked uh, Biff unconsciously by opening the, the door shift and then <laughs> and then suddenly they had to go back to 1955 in order to get the sports almanac from Biff uh, before time runs out. And it gets even worse from there because now he gets to see, you know, this whole deja vu thing by spotting himself that actually had happened at the time. And once they went into the enchantment under the sea dance at high school, yeah, where all of a sudden he's being chased by. Um, Biff's his friends, you know, he's already trying his best to, to look for the almanac and, you know, which has already been hidden and you know, I know Mr. Strickland took it from him and then it turns out that it was just the cover and it was just some magazine, you know, sort of like a Playgirl type of magazine. It even has the, the ooh la la sign and then already with Biff being beat up by uh, George, you know, with that one sucker punch that he gave him. <laughs> Yeah, he actually punched him back again just so he can get the almanac, and which of course he's been chased by the friends, and he had to stop him. But then it gets even worse once he finally completes his mission. Bill showing up uh, right next to him, and he was ready to gonna kick him in the stomach since he already got knocked out by that door. <laughs> so he took the almanac, and and then. Already he was racing all the way through the tunnel, which then, you know, Marty and Ducks uh, had arrived while he was using his uh, hoverboard just to stop him by getting the almanac away from him until <laughs> suddenly Biff actually ran over into the same maneuver truck that happened in, in the movie. <laughs> I don't know, and he keeps saying, Maneuver! I hate maneuver! So then they finally arrive at the empty lot of the Lions Estate where he finally has the chance to burn the sports almanac and suddenly the the matches that has the word Biff on it disappears and becomes an all the detailing shop. And during that huge thunderstorm that it was going to cure, so everything was going complete already as Doc was looking at the newspaper to find out that he's not committed so he's now honored and and George McFly is not murdered anymore. He's now honored for life. So <laughs> the lightning actually has stroke and hit the, the the DeLorean, and it suddenly disappears. But then a courier from Western Union, who was played by Paul Flaggerty, by the way, gave uh, a seven-year-old letter that was written by Doc to Marty, only to find out that he just traveled back in time to 1885, which is going to follow in the third movie later on so the only way to to get back to him is just to go back to see uh, Doc from 1955 who just sent uh, Marty already um, to the future but then I know there was that scene was when Marty finally arrived and he says I know you sent me back to the future but I'm back I'm back from the future and then <laughs> Doc actually says Great Scott and he faints <laughs> as he was shocked about, about what happened. And then, it, and then at the end it says, to be concluded. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what leads to um, Back to the Future Part 3. And 
You know, for a sequel to Back to the Future, I thought it was great. I mean, it's not as good as the original film suggestedly, but I thought it worked pretty well to follow the story as it seems to go on, because that's what it's supposed to be about. You know, they want to continue to go on to see what was it going to be like if Biff actually took over his entire universe once he, he has taken the sports almanac that Marty had that he bought at the store in 2015, of course. So yeah, because it seems like this was uh, Biff's lifelong dream to becoming very wealthy, corrupt, and now he gets to do anything he wants in his life. So it's like a nightmare already. So it's like what Marty had did to, to help his parents and then later his kids, now he has to be in trouble by dealing with Biff Tannen after all this time. And yeah, it's, it's like one crazy nightmare after another. But I have to admit, though, the movie does get very dark compared to the first movie. It's like, yeah, we knew that this was going to happen because it almost feels like in this generation, like, yeah, we're going to get more of this this uh, crazy world that's happening to our neighborhood. Yeah, lots of shootings, graffiti, and all the streets that's going on. I mean, it's it's one scary trip. Yeah, it, it almost felt like it just came from the Terminator or something like that. I mean, when you saw the streets all being messed up and run down and everything. I mean, that's the problem. I think the movie did became very dark because of the fact that this whole movie just became mostly about Biff becoming, you know, the Biff Tannen show for that matter. <laughs> if you think about it. So yeah, he, he pretty much started to ruin the, you know, Marty's dream of becoming rich or or who knows what what was going to happen next. But it also became a problem because of the fact that what the future was going to be like. Because I know Semeca said that he didn't want to do a sequel about what the future was going to be like. Because he thought, you know, this, all of this stuff wasn't going to be true. Yeah, and it's true, it wasn't. Because I know the way 2015 is now is just a fame for the past. Fames are a lot different in this 2015 than it was in the movie version because all of this was just fictionalized so you know it wasn't gonna happen I mean we hardly ever see flying cars anyway I mean they use it as a prototype but it doesn't mean that they're gonna actually have flying cars in this century so that's impossible especially with all the the economy so things have changed since then but I would say it sort of changed for the worse and nowadays, today's technology is, is quite different from what it was in the movie. Because we do have the internet now. We do have all this gadgets, such as cell phones. It's, instead of being a brick, it's now smartphones, touch screens, and everything. We have iPads now. We ha we're now getting those uh, glasses. Yeah, one of those Google glasses that they're making now. Where you get to see um, information and all that. We're even getting Apple Watches. Yeah, we're getting all these uh, selfie sticks and all this other crap that we have in this generation. And of course, you know, we have social networking and, you know, we got laptops and that's more modernized now. But at least it, it isn't what we expected it to be, but we knew we were going to go for it. There are some predictions that they were going to go for it, but let's face it. Those two are not psychic, you know, Bob Gale and, and Robert Zemeckis. They just came up with it as simply as a joke. Just like uh, in the original Back to the Future, is that part of this was just a joke, you know, like they didn't even want to do a sequel in the first place. So they knew this was going to be a problem. But that's the whole purpose. I mean, when he actually said that in his interviews, he thought that when you make a sequel, you have to have an opinion on whenever you're gonna like this movie or you're gonna hate it but either way I think that's just how how the audience had to decide for themselves once they watch these sequels and it, it happens too because sometimes the sequels are just not as good as what the original was supposed to be and it's true and I agree but I think as far as the film's concerned I think it worked pretty well because it does continue the story of what it left off I mean, I, I like the fact that we got to see, you know, 
Marty McFly and his older self, although he does look like sort of a Ed Beckley Jr. type of role, if, if I ever saw one. And while he has a family that that looks exactly like like Marty himself, yeah, he he was all played by, you know, Michael J. Fox, and, and it's all, all done in, in a different shot where you know you actually see them together on one set, um, while you get to see uh, you know Lorraine and and George McFly, you know, and their older selves, you know. Now becoming their grandmothers, and of course you even saw that scene where you get to see, uh, <laughs> you know, Elizabeth Shue's character Jennifer Parker seeing herself too, her older self together in one shot. So I thought that was perfect. Yeah, because I know they use multiple cameras just to shoot that scene, even though it's all done in in a blue screen. Yeah, so I, I thought that was really cool. And, and I like all the shots they use for the film. You know, they use a lot of great special effects, no matter what. All done by Industrial Light and Magic. Yeah, it was, it's the same company that also did the special effects in the original Back to the Future. Which I know I'm going to get to that scene, which I forgot to mention, was when they shot the the scene with the, the DeLorean that was going to go up to 88 miles per hour. And you get to see it actually disappears once it explodes and and shoots right straight to where Doc and Marty were, were standing into that huge tire tracks it's in flames so it's <laughs> so they're like standing on it <laughs> on their feet and it was like a perfect shot right there you know because <laughs> they created all the sparks that they use and everything that they had they, they also did that here when the DeLorean actually disappears once it moves faster, then you can still see the, the tire tracks you know, shooting up, so all the way straight. Yeah, I mean, especially when they do it up in the air and, and it disappears. It's so cool. They did a great job actually shooting those scenes with, with the DeLorean. Yeah. It had really good special effects right there. But also the, the hoverboard scenes, you know, they were done with Industrial Light and Magic by adding all that gravity that they use and I could even tell that they use a lot of CGI in those scenes so it was so yeah early CGI at this point by showing those particular scenes and it's just it was just amazing you know? I almost wish that we had hoverboards already I, I know they're already making prototypes um, which I know Tony Hawk is already writing on one of them so who knows how they're going to be available and I, I know the bottom is just going to pick up all that metal, you know, so it's all magnetic in that sort of way, so it's going to look really cool. But it probably will float on water and it won't be able to work pretty well. Yeah, although I do kind of wish we did have the jackets, uh, like the one that Marty was wearing where it actually does an air dry. <laughs> so it actually dries your own jacket automatically. I, I thought that was really cool. It has a robotic voice included. But either, either way, it is fun. I love the film, despite of its flaws that they went into. I mean, especially with the scenes with Biff Tannen, you know, you know, taking the almanac and he becomes rich and wealthy, and the fact that he shot George McFly, and the whole film became a whole different nightmarish uh, universe that we ever had. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I thought it was great. Um, I'll give you this though. I, I like Claudia Wells better as um, Jennifer Parker than Elizabeth Shue's role because don't get me wrong, Elizabeth Shue is a great actress. I, I liked her in movies like The Karate Kid and The Adventures in Babysitting and then all the other films that she's been doing later on including uh, Leaving Las Vegas. But I, I thought, I don't think her role wasn't that great. As a replacement, so I, I still would have preferred, um, you know, once again, Claudia Wills. But I know she had to take care of her mother, so that's true. Also, another problem was is is uh, Jeffrey Wiseman replacing uh, George McFly. I still prefer um, Crispin Glover in that role because I think the film would have suited so much better with just with Crispin. But of course. 
Yeah, Crispin had money issues. You know, he was dealing with um, with the producers and, and the fact that they demand him to to have his salary. It was like a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, so that wasn't enough uh, to pay him. So it's kind of was a shame. But I, I know originally he wanted to uh, reprise his role again. I figured it out already. It's Vista Glide uh, motion c control camera system that they used to create those scenes of of uh, one actor playing multiple roles you know like what Michael J. Fox had did and same thing with all the other characters yeah even Biff as well <laughs> you know, Thomas L. Wilson playing Biff and Griff or just Biff and older Biff and younger Biff you know. and I really love the fact that it was all shot in deja vu time so you get to see you know <laughs> you know Marty and you know, already you know rocking around with the guitar doing the song, uh, Johnny Be Good, yeah, great to see that scene again and, and all that. So it's like, wow, it, it, it's just it's just awesome. I mean, the whole film is is cool. It, it was great to see the cast again, um, with the exception of Claudia Wells and Crispin Glover. They, they looked like they had a good time, you know, having to do all these stunt work and scenes and everything, where you actually get to see the characters age differently. In that sort of way, and, <laughs> and I thought it was fun. I mean, having experienced all this deja vu stuff that they put into it, and I thought it was awesome. But nevertheless, I love the movie, despite of its problems. Yeah. But that's what we're going to get to in the third movie, to see some of the other problems that they have, too. I, I definitely recommend it. So anyway, I give Back to the Future Part 2 four stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and stay tuned for part three, and I'll see you later. Bye.